joined today by my fellow co-chairs, Safira and Devin, and some members of our incredible, incredible executive committee, who you will meet shortly. Um, and the purpose of our event today is, first of all, we envision this as a first event in a series of events that we will be leading um, and head and hosting with, alongside with our partners in the lead up to CSW. And today really is an opportunity for you all to meet our executive committee, uh, ask them your burning questions, get their insight. Um, and get their experience and expertise from topics uh, more specifically related to the forum itself, more broadly about gender equity, the SDGs, whatever you want to ask them, they are yours for the day. So we're really excited to kick that off. But before we go uh, more deeper into our agenda, we recognize that there may be some young leaders and young professionals on the call who may not be as familiar with NGO CSW and um, the upcoming forum in March. So for just a bit of context, uh, the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, we sometimes like to think of ourselves really as the civil society arm of the UN because through our work, we really uplift uh, and advocate for the inclusion of feminist leadership and the voices of women rights and feminist organizations from all around the world in UN deliberations and processes. Um, and each year, specifically with the annual um, Committee on the Status of Women Forum, we help bring the largest gathering on civil society feminists and women's, or women's uh, rights organizers to the UN convening together as many as 10,000 civil society activists and advocates from around the world, um, helping schedule, manage, and organize upwards of 400 parallel events at the UN. So it's all very, very exciting. It's an incredible event and forum that takes place over a two week time period each year. And of course the forum is going to look a little different this year. It's gone virtual, but we are excited about this opportunity because we are nimble, we are flexible. And for the first time ever, we will be convening together global activists in a more broader way than we've ever had done before because we don't anymore have to deal with the legal, financial and travel related constraints that we usually have. Now, anyone from anywhere in the world can join us and we are very excited about that. And of course, the theme for this year's, or the priority theme for this year's CSW Forum is the full and effective leadership and participation of women. And who better to talk about leadership and the full and effective participation of women than our executive committee. Our executive committee is really made up of some seasoned activists and advocates for gender equity. Uh, they are they have they are a part of the uh, NGO CSW executive committee because they envision the strategy, the work, the execution of everything that happens at NGO CSW, and they really are the heart of civil society presence and inclusion in the UN space, specifically as it relates to gender equity. And they are yours today. You can ask them your questions. Um, and they are, I myself am a proud member of the executive committee and I can say with all my heart that it is an incredibly intergenerational, inclusive space. Uh, and we're so excited for you all to meet the other members of our executive committee. So before we move forward, I'm going to turn it over to Devon, who's going to take us through a quick survey. Devon, over to you. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to launch this poll here. Um, so we just have a couple questions just to see um, who we have on the call, what um, people's familiarity is with um, CSW and um, the forum. So you should all see the poll. And um, I don't, okay, there we go. And I'll just give it a minute for everyone to get their responses in. All right, so looks like it's slowing down. So we have um, most of you intend to join the CSW or the forum this year, 
which is awesome. Um, about half, split about halfway um, uh, to those who have attended the CSW or the NGO CSW forum before. Um, most of you are from North America and Europe, but we have some people from Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America and the Caribbean. And we have some people under 18, um, some between 18 to 25, some between 25 and 35, and some over 40. Thanks everyone for doing that quick poll. And I'll hand it over to Safira or Hootie. Yeah. Safira. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Safira, also serving as one of the co-chairs for the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals. Um, so I get the lovely opportunity to introduce some of our members of the Executive Committee to you. Um, and really, as was mentioned, this is a time where we're wanting to give you the opportunity to, to speak to our members of the Executive Committee, ask your questions, um, but also for us to hear some of their tips. They've been engaging um, for many, many years at the UN. Um, so we have asked them to give that, to share with us today some top tips or little pieces of advice that they would offer us in terms of our advocacy. Um, and also any kind of experience that they've had that, that has been particularly effective at the UN. So those are the two things that we're asking them to kind of open with and share with us today. Um, so we have a few members of our executive committee on the call. And I will start by introducing Huri Gudalekian, um, who is the chair of NGO CSW, and many of you may have seen her before, um, but she has a decade of experience working at the UN. She's um, worked with NGO CSW both as the office coordinator and on the executive committee as the communications secretary. She is the UN coordinator of Unchained at Last, which is an organization that fights to stop early marriage in the US. Um, and she's been involved in many other kind of UN civil society um, working groups, including the working group on girls. Um, so we'll start with Huri. I see that we have Yvonne, um, Azi, and potentially Rosa, who will also join. And then we'll have a few other members of the executive committee who will join us um, a little bit later, Ivy and Susan, and I'll introduce all of them as we go. But we'll start with a few minutes from Huri. Thank you. Uh, this is so exciting. I love sharing uh, whatever knowledge I have to inspire people to come on board because as Safira said, I have been in this field for only the last 10 years. I'm almost 60 years old. So the first half of my life was in a completely different world, uh, which I really loved. But once I got into the UN, I really didn't know that much about it. And it was it just made sense to me. And I looked at the questions that came ahead of time and there's so many amazing questions to deal with, but I'll concentrate on what Safira wants me to do, which is just a little bit about my experience and maybe some success stories on why UN, why do we still fight for you know, some um, equality or rights through the UN? Because there's de definitely different ways of doing it. You should definitely be considering fighting for rights locally, uh, nationally, and then there's of course the UN, which influences all national um, policies as well. So, um, and, and just like Safira said, I know there were a lot of questions about girls' participation, youth participation, and I know the feeling of not being able to be heard. That was somehow the first half of my life where I felt like I wasn't being heard, not at the UN, just in general. So I know that feeling and that frustration. All I can tell you is that you might even feel like that when you're in UN or in organizations where you think that you're not being heard. I always say, if, they, if you didn't succeed in a certain way to get into the conversation, don't give up, try another way, try another way. And one of the things I always recommend, this is even in my mentorship, sometimes I say, is that you know when you're asking for something, you always have to be ready to say what it is that you can provide to that person, right? So even if you're going to member states to ask for a policy change or you want, you have recommendations on 
what they should be inputting in a document or whatever. Always think about that member state and what are their needs, what are their concerns, and how does your ask really connect with that? And my, my success story example is actually a good example of that. Um, again, I'm looking at the clock. You only said a few minutes. So maybe I'll just give a quick success story that I learned earlier on, um, which is to say how UN works. Um, but, but okay, so I'll just get to that. So it was, I, I think the second or the third year, I was a member of the executive committee and I was a co-chair of the planning committee for the forum. So I was learning a lot about how things work. And when somebody came up to me and said, and at the time I was actually representing Armenian Relief Society. Um, and the chair of the committee was not Armenia. I don't even remember who it was, but I had already done many visits with executive committee with member states. So I knew how to communicate with them. And like I said earlier, I knew what to ask for why and how. So I had found out that there was this really serious issue of sex selection in Armenia, which I wasn't aware of, but it came up. And um, UNDP, Save the Children, a few other organizations were bringing this topic into the CSW and they approached me and they said, how can we get the attention of the Armenian mission to really address this issue? So it's a serious issue. Sex selection is like girls don't even have a chance to be born, right? Um, and we all knew that there, it was a big issue in China and India, but we didn't think that it could pop up in other countries as well. So originally, um, when we went to visit, of course, the member states said, well, we don't know about this. Like, you know, most of the time, member states do not want to admit of what's going wrong in their country. But we kept really bringing examples and, and data and stories of how this was not only bad for families and for obviously gender equality, but it was really bad for the country, for the population. And sure enough, I remember two days before an event that we were organizing to speak about this issue and the mission refused to participate, like literally two days before they responded to one of our emails and said, you know, I think you're right. If we can't put our head in the sand for this and we want to engage with you and we want to learn so we can see what we can do. So they came to the event, they made a commitment to look into it. And then about six months later, it was actually brought to the parliament to see what laws they can put, what, it, what kind of education. And this is really key as well. Laws are, alone are not enough. And what you need to talk with governments and most governments are aware of this, it's two pronged, right? You know, you make the laws on the um, upper level but you really need to have the society educated on the topic so that they can actually deliver on what the laws are asking them to do because sometimes it's just um, cultural. So I think I'm gonna stop there. I have so many other things to add but I would love to answer questions later. Thank you for this opportunity. You can chat with me and I can answer your questions while others are talking. Thanks again. Perfect, thank you so much, Huri. So I'd like to give the floor now to Ivan. Ivan is another member of our um, NGO executive committee as a delegate at large, and she represents Africa Development Interchange Network at the United Nations. Um, she's a secretary of the New York City for CEDAW, um, working to bring a Bill of Rights to end all forms of discrimination against women. And she's also the past chair of the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development in New York, among many other, a long list of things that, that Yvonne does and has done over many, many years at the UN. So I'll turn over to Yvonne to give us a few just opening tips and advice that you would give to the young people on the call today. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Safira. Um, it's good to be here with uh, all these young people. Um, and it reminds me that I started my activities as a very young person um, when I was elected from the floor of my church to be on the vestry. And in the Episcopal Church, the vestry would, what if you it was a cooperation, it would be the board of directors. So, uh, so I started out from a very young age and I actually came to the UN through the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, um, where the Anglican women from around the world would come, you know, to have our voices heard. So, um, so 
I, uh, that's one way to get your foot into the door. A large organization behind you and, um, and an organizations that work at the grassroots level. We need to remove that. Um, it's a, fa a faith based organization. So um, that's how I came to be involved. And um, it's just a matter of and, and one of the things that I have learned at the at the UN is to, you know, approach people, not be afraid to talk. For instance, in 2013, I um, wanted to do an event at my parish. Um, uh, around um, CSW, and and I was listening to to somebody speak um, from from the Population Fund, and this was and I was like, oh my gosh, she would be the ideal person to be um, our moderator for this panel that I wanted to have with Anglican women from around the world. And so I ran up to her afterwards and I said, would you do this? And and she said and she said yes, you know, to to, to send her the information. And this was the, um, you know, a co-executive director of the UN Population Fund, and we were a very small organization that had no name no, and 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 no visibility anywhere. And we ended up having a side event because the Population Fund put it on their on their calendar, and they made a big deal out of it. And that evening um, at my parish, we had all these ambassadors and and executives from the UN attending this information. And just because I had the chutzpah to go to this lady and say, would you moderate my panel? So I think it's great to be at the UN and actually engage with people and not be afraid to engage and lots of things can happen. So I'll, I'll stop here for now and, um, and just look forward to taking some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And I'd like to introduce Azi, Azadeh Khalili. Um, who is the communications secretary of NGO CSW. So she's a feminist activist dedicated to strengthening the social justice movement um, and is a United Nations representative for the International Alliance of Women and a former founding executive director of the New York City Commission on Gender Equality with the de Blasio administration. So I'll, I'll hand over to Azi to share a few tips and, and experiences that she has had engaging mm -hmm. at the event. Thank you, Safira, Saida, and Devon for organizing this event. What an amazing turnout. Um, I'm very honored to have a chance to, um, to say a few words. Um, I was born and raised in Iran, uh, and um, I come uh, from a family that uh, where the women were not feminist, although the women fought very hard for, their, for our rights. Uh, but uh, um, feminism was not ideas that I grew up around. And I never thought it in a million years that I would have a chance to work with the UN, for example. Um, that was, the, you know, being part of these institutions was not part of my upbringing. Um, and it turns out that every woman can, um, can um, be involved in two things to have her feet in two worlds. One, every woman can be involved, every woman and young girl can be involved in her, her local community, really bring about grassroots changes in her local community, um, which is very important. And at the same time, connect to global forces. Being connected with NGO CSW uh, New York uh, is one way in which you can connect to global forces and learn more about declarations and 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 um, treaties and policies and laws that affect women on a global level, um, and also you can bring. Uh, um, you can bring um, issues that are important to your communities that are not being heard on the local level 
to the UN so that you can be heard at that level. Um, it's very important for us to connect on a global level. Sisterhood is global and um, we're all experiencing sexism and male domination in our lives. And this is a wonderful way of connecting, backing each other and sharing best practices together. So again, I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to connecting with you. Feel free to also chat with me um, if you would like to. Thank you, Safira. Thank you so much, Ozzy. So we're going to pause here. We've heard kind of a, a little collection from our first three uh, members of our executive committee, a little collection of tips and, and some of these very inspiring experiences. So we wanna pause and open up um, for some questions. So if you would like to speak, you're welcome to raise your hand or just kind of indicate, turn on your video and indicate that you would like to speak. Um, you're also welcome to post questions in the chat. I know a number of you also sent in questions um, prior to this event. So we will also be looking at some of those to kind of pose questions to our executive committee over the course of today. Um, but wanted to just pause and, and allow this opportunity for us to kind of engage um, and ask our three executive committee members any questions that you might have at this point. So I see, one hand already raised. Fando, if you would like to speak. Hello, Safira, and thank you so much to all of the speakers. My name is Tando Kumete. I am from South Africa. I'm a young feminist educator. I'm also a lawyer, as well as a technology entrepreneur. And um, I really just, I want to make this brief, but you know, in my country, as you all know, it's, it's the most unequal society in the world and the rape capital, one of the rape capitals of the world. And here a woman is more likely to die from femicide than to uh, get a job. Um, and the feminist movements in South Africa really heated up over the past three years from having the largest mass movement of almost 100,000 women hitting the streets to fight against uh, gender-based violence. And um, us also going to industry to force them to take a levy or to give us a levy to fund the fight against gender-based violence. Now, unfortunately, South Africa is also a country that struggles with uh, corruption. And so accessing even a space like CSW is a huge crisis. And there's usually a lot of favoritism and um, kind of picking of who's going to go based on connection. So my question really is how do we actually open up um, access to the space to allow for people who are actually competent and qualified to go and engage on these platforms. And my last question is really, what is the relevance of um, uh, CSW in ensuring that the things that are decided and agreed upon at the actual event become a lived reality for women and queer people and people living with disabilities? Because I can tell you now that if you were to ask a group of people in South Africa what CSW is, they wouldn't be able to answer you, number one. And number two, since our participation in South Africa in this platform, our condition as women and children, and especially queer people and people, with, uh, people living with disabilities has only worsened. So what monitoring mechanisms exist to ensure that the things that are agreed upon are actually being realized? And do you have a system of relegating and removing countries who simply do not want to practically realize the emancipation of, of women and other marginalized groups? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thando. So maybe we can take a couple of questions and then turn back to our executive committee members. I see Faluke has a hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who is on this call. I uh, want to refer to Margaret, you know, Owen's comment on widows. Um, I'm, I'm speaking from, from Nigeria and um, I, I, I just uh, thought, you know, that as uh, activists, we should begin to pay attention, you know, to the issues that surround, you know, widows. Uh, particularly now that the demographics you know, for widow, like she said, is changing. And with COVID-19, from the data you know, um, I have here, uh, we, uh, we observe that more men die you know, from COVID-19 uh, than women. So that means we are having more widows and this time younger widows. 
we should you know begin to pay you know attention to their issues more than ever before so how can we work together you know to begin to look at women's issues as heterogeneous you know the categorization people just look at women as oh women one homogeneous you know, group it's not one homogeneous you know, group and there are some people that are disproportionately you know affected by uh, the different environmental and social challenges you know uh, across the globe uh, that's uh, where i'm going to stop how can we together you know help weak you know economies or weak nations you know to provide infrastructure and services that you know can help you know empower the most vulnerable of our lords which are in this regard you know our, our widows thank you Wonderful, thank you. So next we have Gabrielle, over to you. Hi, my name is Gabby and I am a senior in high school. My question is directed to Ms. Azadeh Khalili. Um, I'm just wondering how you're able to reconcile your current position with fighting for gender rights with the country that you come from in Iran with a more traditional um, outlook and how do you reconcile your current position with your heritage and your family way of life. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Gabby. And we'll take one more from Emily, and then we'll turn back to our EC members. So the floor is yours, Emily. Thank you, Safir. Um, my name is Emilia Miki, and I'm joining in from Cameroon. Um, my question is about the situation for vulnerable women and girls, especially grassroots women who live in conflict affected communities. Um, it's becoming very challenging with COVID and ongoing conflict where most of them are stranded. Like we provide support for women and girls that are affected by conflict in Cameroon, the agricultural crisis. And resources are so not available because with COVID, a lot of funding and support has been limited for nonprofits like the one I run called the Nismiki Foundation. But then the conflicts have not stopped. We still see serious situations happening. So what's the advice for grassroots women leaders like ourselves or those working on the front lines on sustaining programs and running projects that impact the lives of women and girls? Because most of them will come with very sorrowful stories and needs with numerous challenges and we just cannot keep giving psychosocial support because that is not all that is needed. Most of the time they need more than just the counseling, psychosocial support, those who are rape victims, become pregnant. Like we have a case that is seven months gone in pregnancy, has not started prenatal cl clinics, doesn't have a home to stay in, there is no shelter. So what advice can be given in programs like this because with COVID, most projects are not being funded. There is very limited call for funding. Most activities now are online. So how can we contribute to these processes? And greetings from my daughter. <laughs> Sweet, thank you. So we'll just pause here on the questions and turn um, back to our EC members, Huri, Ivan, and Azi in that order, if there was anything that you would like to say in response. Absolutely, thank you so much. That's brilliant, brilliant questions and comments. And I'm sorry we didn't hear from Carlos, the one male, but I'm sure we'll he'll get he'll get his turn. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Please be patient. We'll hear from you too, because I always love seeing male um, fighting for our rights along with us. So Tando from, from South Africa. I mean, everything you said is what we live and breathe day and night. What you know, access, not having access is an issue. There's this issue of ECOSOC accredited organizations, which I don't want to waste time going, but I can put links later on what you what I mean. UN has made it over the years a little bit harder for civil society voices to be heard at UN, which is why NGO CSW has become more relevant. Uh, we've been doing this for years, but in the last 10 years, as there's been what we call pushback, which I'm sure you all know uh, what that means, it has made it important for us to do what we're doing today is to hear from people who don't have access to UN so that we can bring your voices in there. Relevance. 
Um, I question that sometimes. Sometimes I throw my hands up in the air and I go, why are we fighting? Because every time we go one step forward, somebody pushes us two steps back. And that I can talk about that in three countries that I'm directly related to. I'm Armenian, born in Beirut, Lebanon, and I've been in New, in New York City for 40, 45 years now. Um, so I basically grew up in New York City, but I'm very close to my cultures. And, and I can tell you, Armenia, we, when we finally were excited that we have a progressive government, then both neighbors in, to our left and right attacked us and now are threatening to really have our progressive government, democratic government step down and reverse every gain that we have made. The same with Lebanon, corrupt government and intentions are there and they're not advancing. And the United States, do I need to say too much about United States? We all know what we went through for four years, pushback on climate from reproductive rights, everything that we fought for. Um, so it's really frustrating and it's always one step at a time, right? So just very quickly, I also want to give a shout out to Generation Equality Forum, which really addresses the implementation and accountability piece. I'll put the link here if you have not heard about this, this campaign. So CSW, you know, we bring voices, governments listen to us, they try to make changes, we educate from grassroots bottom up so that you know they know what the laws are so they can ask for laws. And that's what implementation and accountability is all about. So for years, we've been frustrated that we fight for, um, for change, but then we don't see it implemented and we don't have civil society or grassroots you know, bottom up methodology where we're holding our local, national and global governments accountable for what they're not delivering. Beijing plus 25, right? I can tell you that. So uh, UN Women created this um, um, Generation Equality Forum, which basically is the same thing we're doing in, at CSW, but outside of UN to see if with less pushback from far right governments, can we achieve? We don't know that yet because the forums were postponed because of COVID. Why do we have COVID? Because governments have not provided universal health care. So everything that we have been asking for, if we really were able to achieve it, we would all be in a better place, which kind of answers Emily's question on uh, in Cameroon about COVID effect. It's really unfortunate. It's because we, we never achieved our rights. And a quick shout out to what uh, uh, Fuluka said from Nigeria, Young Widows. We have um, an amazing fighter here, Margaret Owen, who's, who's, who's been chatting. Please read what she said. She's one of our older members who's been fighting for years about um, widows and um, ageism, but also the fact that you know young widows sometimes are not considered because they're young, they're just married young. So I wanted to just quickly brush over all of those responses and then I'll be back later. Thank you. Thank you, Huri. Back to Yvonne. Well, um, gosh, Huri um, touched on, on most of the points. Um, it's, it's a very difficult world that we're living in now, especially with COVID, um, where, where smaller problems have really become, uh, well, not really small problems, but problems that we weren't coping with in terms of especially the um, the violence against women, which has gotten really out of hand during COVID with um, people staying at home um, and being with their, their perpetrators 24-7 um, when, you know, with full lockdowns. Um, and that's one of the questions that I have grappled with um, over the years that I've been involved with the United Nations and especially looking at, at women's issues. And, um, and my question is always, why is there so much violence against women. Why aren't women empowered? I come from a very sm small island um, where when I was growing up there many years ago, um, maybe there were about, well, there was less than a thousand people on the island and, and a thousand would be a lot at that time. Um, and I, I found, and when I think back on that, on that society, um, there was really um, gender equity. Um, women had as much rights as men. 
Um, women could own property. My great grandmother was widowed at a very young age and she had to raise her, her children, her, her daughters. Um, and my grandmother and my great grandmother were very, very influential people in the society. They had, they had boys, I mean, my, they were entrepreneurs. And so I come from that background. And, but when I see the violence, I don't understand the violence against women. And one of the things I said, we have to look at what causes it? What is the root cause? And there are many causes, but one of the things I, all, I see as a solution is that mothers are the ones that, that really um, socialize their children and mothers need to teach their both, view both their sons and their daughters equally and not see a distinction. And I will go back to my little island and say that I noticed that women favored their sons. Where I came from, I had two brothers and believe me, my two brothers were the ones that my mother loved. I didn't see that she, that she really cared about me. She died when I was uh, eight years old. And the only thing I have to hold on to that my mother loved me was that on her dying bed, she asked, how is Yvonne? And I hold on to that and said, oh, well, maybe she did love me. So I really, really would like to see mothers socialize their boys and girls equally. And I think that that would um, probably ease some of the problems going forward with the distinction between um, men and boys. I mean, men and women. Thank you for sharing that, Yvonne. It's nice to hear your personal story. Um, and I'll hand over to Azadeh. Great, thank you. Um, I am going to um, speak to the question that Gabrielle Ostad asked. Um, thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. Uh, let me just say that uh, gender inequality, sexism and male domination are global and they exist basically in every corner of the world. And uh, Iran does not have monopoly over oppression, right? Um, uh, and, fem uh, and feminist movement is very strong in Iran, and it's actually being led by young women. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, uh, many of the young women are being imprisoned for standing up for their rights. Um, and we have seen incredibly courageous, creative um, oppositions uh, that have happened in Iran. Um, and also we know that human rights defenders are, are behind bars. If you have the chance next Thursday, NGOCSW will be, um, will be hosting an event and we're um, highlighting the life and the work of um, Nasrin Sotudeh, who is a, a human rights lawyer, human rights defender in Iran, who has been imprisoned for many, many months and will be speaking uh, to her ac accomplishments, continuous accomplishments, and um, how those of us who live outside of Iran can support, um, support her. Um, and um, and what I want to say is that um, I think that um, those of us who are feminists, those of us who are activists, those of us who are working on both local level and global level get to speak to um, any time a woman is being um, oppressed because she's standing up for women's rights. And we see that all around the globe. And I think that for Iranian women, I think who don't live in Iran, it's very important for us to speak up as much as we can um, and write about it, speak about it and, and not let our sisters in Iran, uh, not let them down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azzy. So I'd like to give Carlos a chance to speak if he would still like to say something. Then we can turn to Margaret Owen. And then I would like to invite um, two of our experienced youth activists who have participated in CSW before, Nirmala and Shane, to kind of share their, their tips and their experience with us. So Carlos, was there anything you wanted to add? Or a question? Hi. So, so, so amazing to be here with all of you again. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, happy 20, 2021, I hope this year will be full of happiness and health to everyone. Let's pray that COVID will disappear very soon. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for this opportunity, this space, since I've been in um, participating in GoCSWU um, events since 2000. 
20 since last year. And I remember I was talking to Hori the first time at the end of the of my first modeling meeting and CSW. Uh, and I remember I told her that this was so amazing because I am in Venezuela and I will never thought that I could be in a meeting with people from all around the world or or, or in our organization in New York City. Like it's unbelievable what is happening right now. And more than a question is, um, I want just, uh, it's just a comment and I want to say, this is the highest opportunity for all of us in, in all of our countries to make a difference, not just in our country, but internationally, worldwide. We are here with activists from all over the world who are having an amazing work. Maybe not, maybe the same as us, maybe another type of work, but it, the thing is that we are all fighting for the same thing, equality, equality for women, equality for them to be what they can, what they have to be. It's, we are in 2021, it's not the time for to say that women are not capable. Women are really capable and they have been really capable since the very beginning. And we can see that since the moment people try to underestimate them. So right now, if we want to make a change, if we really want to enjoy and, and give, it, give it all in these meetings, um, I invite you all to speak in the chat, let your, your email, let your phone number, tell us who you are, what you're doing, and we will co connect there. And we will connect and we can, you know, boil, boil uh, a, a strong uh, partnership internationally to work better and to know each other works to do something better. So thank you so much to your leaders and your professionals program and thank you to Engo CS Toledo. Thank you, Carlos. And if I may just kind of echo some of these thoughts. This is the first event of a series of eight events. Every Thursday for the next eight weeks, we're wanting to have this space. Um, which really over time we're hoping we can get to know one another. We can kind of build these networks. We've put a little link to a WhatsApp group um, in the chat. We have a Slack channel, we have a LinkedIn page, which Devin will speak about a little bit more towards the end of this um, event. But it really is the more that we can share and ask questions and kind of have a little bit of regularity to our coming together that we'll get to know one another and be able to find points of, of collaboration. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to turn over to Margaret Owen. To share a few thoughts. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me and see me? Can you? Yes, I'm thrilled can. to be yes, with yes, all you young yes, people and yes, a lot of middle aged people, and particularly Carlos, Carlos, our man, our young man. It's terribly important that we have men on our side on all the issues that we feel deeply about. I loved what Yvonne had to say. Like, I'm like her, I have two older brothers. My mother absolutely adored my older brothers. And again, just like Yvonne, I'm sure she loved me, but my goodness, how she favored my older brothers. And so there is a lot to be said, but we don't really understand how it can be that men who are brothers, sons and fathers all over the world, particularly when they're in armies or militias, can go around raping women and children. I'm thinking at the moment about what is happening in Kashmir, where there are unbelievable gang rapes of women. Most of them are widows now. How this is happening that all over the world that rape is a weapon of war, but also we've seen that in the context of the pandemic, all over the world, in my country here in the UK as well, in every country, women in lockdown situations, caught up and confined, are also experiencing a huge increase in appalling violence against women. So I think it's really, really important that it is in the curricula of all our schools that little boys, if they're not going to be taught that at home, they are made aware 
that violence against women is a crime and that women have equal rights to men, that, women, that human rights mean women's rights. And of course, they also mean widows' rights. But I'm just going to give you one example. I just remember the other day, Mary Robinson, who was one of our best ever heads of the um, uh, OCHR in Geneva. And she was talking about having to have men working with men. And she said it in a wonderful way. She said, there are in every country very serious men like Carlos here, who actually do understand that if you don't, if women don't have equal rights, if there's no gender equality or women's empowerment, you do not have democracy, you do not have peace, you do not have a stable society. And just so this is terribly, terribly important that when we talk and the priority theme for this year's CSW is about women in leadership, women in decision making. We want to be able to share it with men. I'm always worried about when we talk about a feminist foreign policy. Well, no, we, want, we don't want it to be women on our own. We want to be women with men. But who is it who makes war? men, 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 and patriarchy. But I'm going to just leave you with one good example. I think it's important that we look around the world to see are there any best practices that we can learn from, adapt, and change. Now, Yvonne knows all about what I do in, with Kur the Kurds and Kurdistan and Rojava, but there is a place in Northeast Syria it's now called the Autonomous Administration of North Syria, but it's actually, we know it as Rojava, where, I mean, it's under terrible threat now because it's in a war zone and it's very fragile, but there they have women's equality and gender equality, women's empowerment absolutely central. And every single institution, whether it's the army, the government, the courts, the police, the uh, companies, the health facilities, the universities, every single decision-making body from the top down to the village has as their co-chairs. You never have a president or a chair. You always have a man and a woman. In all the mayors of the cities, it's a man and a woman. If we look at any of the countries in the world, the ones that have most gender equality is where there is most peace and most stability. So I don't want to talk anymore, but my question is to all of you, please tell us what you think we older women yes we care terribly that your young voices are heard and i worry so much about the effects of the lockdowns and the pandemics on all our young people's education but particularly our girls education because we're finding in the uk that actually it's girls who are facing more uh, discrimination in their education if they're locked down than boys if there's only one laptop in the family it'll go to the boy and not the girl the girl will be left there cooking and cleaning and washing up so um i just I think tell us how we older people what more can we do don't cut us out because we're old because we believe in you you're our hope and your future but please tell us how we can do more to help you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. That's beautiful. Thank you for your support. Um, I'm just going to pause us here and I'm going to turn to Nirmala, um, who is a, an experienced youth activist from Nepal, who's going to share some top tips for engaging at CSW with us. So over to you, Nirmala. Uh, thank you, Safira. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me on this forum. I'm really happy uh, to share my experiences and uh, tips uh, to other youths. 
So uh, hello again, I am Nirmala, SRHO activist from Nepal. I'm an indigenous young woman coming from a small village in Nepal. So like uh, this year will be my third CSWDU. For me, like CSWDU has given a useful platform to work with our government to include our concern into the outcome document. And also it has provided me the platform to showcase what I was doing in my local community and, you know, expose uh, to others who were doing in their deal with you all. The first one is it is really important to build local and national contact as it gives you an insight of what issues your country will be bringing to the conversation. And second is the research prior to the CSW. Research on previous CSW conversation at uh, country, regional, and global level. Familiarize with the theme of the CSW every year and contextualize the topic. This will be really helpful to understand the discussion. And third one is very important, that is network, network, and network. The CSW is a great platform for networks. There will be so many opportunities to network, connect with individuals and groups that you know, whom you meet at the commissions, and there will be given opportunities to be heard and seen at CSW. So make yourself and your organization visible at CSW. And other one is so many side events will be there at CSW. Prioritize which ones will add value to your work and passion. There will be CSW handbook or I said it's a CSW guidebook with information of all the side events that will really help you a lot to prioritize uh, which event to go and where to go. And the last one, uh, which is I find quite important and which I felt myself also like with CSW one out is real. You know, you can get overwhelmed with everything happening at the same time, meeting so many people time and again, and so many agendas, many more things are going on. So like, it's really important to take time to solve them, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much. It's, it's very helpful to hear some of these tips and also make use of this as a space to kind of network and help prepare and, and get ready for the commission. Um, I'd like to turn over to Shane now from Canada um, to also give us some tips um, on engaging at the CSW. Over to you, Shane. Thanks, Safira. So as Safira said, I am a young activist from Canada and I've been very fortunate to participate a few times now at CSW, especially in person. Uh, so I just kind of picked out some very common tips that I usually tell other, especially new delegates um, in the delegations that I've participated with. So the first thing I always tell young people is to plan. Before you go, you need to plan. Uh, so as Nirmala said, it is very overwhelming. There's a lot of events. So I usually take a couple days to go through the schedules, find the events that best suit the kind of the topics that I'm interested in, the work that I'm doing, as well as the organizations that I'm very interested in and as well research research the speakers from the events that you're interested in as well as the organizations because it first kind of helps you get understand the perspective that they might be coming from but it also has helped me a lot in identifying that yes this is an organization that maybe I want to work with or I want to talk to or maybe this is a speaker that I'd like to introduce myself to and talk to a little bit more uh, and the other two piece of advice that I definitely have for young people are probably two of the most important things I ever learned, not just at CSW, but in working nationally as well as internationally as an activist is the importance of using your voice and especially as a young person. So environments like CSW are truthfully for young people, very intimidating. There's a very large environment. There's a lot going on and it can be really hard to speak up. So I'm a very quiet person. I don't like talking. So this is definitely something that I have a lot of firsthand experience in. Uh, so what I tell myself as well as other people is to challenge yourself, use your voice. If you have a question, ask your question. If you are like me and you really hate talking to a big room of people, don't be afraid to go up and talk to the people on the panel after the event, give them your business card, ask if you can have a longer conversation, ask them out to coffee, just network as Nirmala said. Uh, because as young people, 
we have voices and we have voices that are really important to be included and to be heard on these platforms. And to kind of tie into that is the importance of challenging thoughts of imposter syndrome. So as I said, I've worked a lot with other youth delegates as well as I work a lot with youth organizations here in Canada. And all too often I hear a lot of you saying, I don't belong here. I don't qualify to be at this table. I've sat beside people at CSW who have been working in these topics longer than I have been alive. And that is a terrifying thing. And it can be really hard to feel like you qualify to be in that room or to contribute to this conversation. So what I tell not just myself, but other people as well, especially young people who come to me and just feel really down about their time at CSW is everyone brings something to the table. You, you're here for a reason. You represent a voice and a perspective that needs to be heard. Nobody can share your lived experience or your perspectives better than you can. And like I said, youth need to be heard in these environments. They need to be heard at all levels and engage in this dialogue. There is so much other advice I could definitely give you about CSW. I definitely can't touch on them all, but I think I'll stop with these ones. Those were some great tips. Thank you so much, Shane. It's really wonderful to hear um, tips from our executive committee members and then also to hear from our peers who've, who've had this experience and kind of really thought um, strategically and carefully about how to engage at, at a commission that can be very overwhelming and um, crowded. And um, yeah, that was really wonderful. Thank you to both of you. Um, so I did want to circle back to Mr. Kensington. Um, I did see your hand up earlier, whether there was um, a question that you had either for our EC members or um, about these tips that were shared from Nirmala and Shane. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I'm Kensington. I'm uh, calling from Zimbabwe uh, in a village. It's um, a very, very country life, uh, this side. Um, I'm, my concern is um, on um, the, the, the issue of um, the lockdown here in Zimbabwe, child marriages. Um, where I come from, I'm uh, in a, a small district, a very small district, a, a mining community. And uh, most girls, they've been uh, out of school uh, in, as a result of this uh, uh, lockdown that has been uh, uh, imposed uh, in, in response to COVID-19. Uh, these girls, uh, young girls, they are getting married very early and it's very, very worrisome. Uh, I'm speaking uh, from the area uh, that this is, the, the place that where this is happening uh, just today, a 12 year old, uh, I was at a certain police station and a 12 year old was, a 12 year old girl was, uh, was raped and by a, a 62 year old uh, man. Uh, it's, it's really terrifying this side. Um, I wanted to ask uh, in relation to, to CSW, actually I didn't know about CSW and, uh, until someone uh, told me about it and um, I introduced me to that to that platform. I wanted to know exactly: Are there any any platforms that uh, the organization is uh, availing to, to 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 people here in Zimbabwe, uh, where they can uh, uh, seek assistance, as in the young girls who are facing this thing, or any programs that are aiming at uh, alleviating or slowing down this, the rate of uh, these effects uh, towards the, the young girls, especially the, the, the young girls uh, a, in this time of, uh, of lockdown, because actually the, 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 the rate of child marriage is very, very terrifying. At one school actually where they are, they, they, they are about, uh, there were 52 girls and since the beginning of the lockdown, um, 39 girls, they, they just got married and uh, it's really terrifying. I, I think that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm a man and I, 
it it pains me. <laughs> so, uh, that's all I, that I can say for now. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Perfect. Thank you. And an important point. So perhaps we can take if there were any more questions or anyone wanted to offer a few additional tips about engaging, we can take a few more comments um, before we turn back to um, our EC members and our youth activists to respond. We also have one more executive committee member who's just joined us, Susan, but we'll take the questions first and then I'll introduce Susan O'Malley. Um, so feel, feel welcome to raise your hand if there was something more. I see um, Seema, I see your hand. Um, then Sam Sudin and then Thando again. Hello everyone, thank you for this wonderful forum. Uh, I want to tell one thing, I'm from India and uh, Margaret very rightly said about Kashmir. Uh, I would like to say that the situation is not only bad in Kashmir because I personally, my organization, we work in small villages. So the situation is really not that very good for Kashmir, neither it is in the villages. At the same time, cities, I'm talking about cities like Mumbai, cities like Gurgaon, which are the most happening cities, which are the hub of corporations. There are incidences which are really sad that are happening there as well. And CSW, like, you know, if I talk about CSW, uh, if I go to an interior place in India, or if I go to a small town in India, there is not much awareness about it. There is not much help about it. So even when, when we go there, the kind of help and support that we need to go into more, to go and connect with more women, it becomes very difficult. Like there's a project that have, we've been, we've been struggling to do this project from past four years. And in last four years, we have been able to get 3,628 women come up and file cases and get justice. But still, you know, there are many more out there, and you know, but there is more that is required to go in and do that with the kind of forum that we have, like CSW. If things can, you know, go globally, like if we are connecting now on this platform, if we can connect more often like this, you know, there's more help that can reach in the interiors, and there's more that we can actually do because with forum like this, technologies like this, it is easier to render help to at least, you know, raise a voice and get. Uh, help not only help but you know advice which is very important at times you don't know what to do but when we get advice when we get to listen to people like margaret listen like people like hori you know you people like you on you know you feel so good that there are such good people doing so much work and you get motivated you get enlightened you know so all i can say is it's good to connect and i'm really thankful that i could connect on this forum thank you so much Wonderful, thank you. So we'll have Sam Sudin, Thander, and then Gabrielle, and then I will hand over to Saida to introduce um, a few more members of our executive committee who've just joined us. So Sam Sudin, over to you. Good evening, good evening everyone. How are we doing today? So looking at the issue of um, abuse among women, it's a terrible thing here in Nigeria too. And then um, most times we trace it back into the issue of um, our, some of our cultural factors that is being practiced here in the part of the world. I mean, generally, Africa, like I was who identified to earlier. Africa is, um, I've divided to find nine women in this part of the world, and it's really very, very bad. And it's a thing that in a few years to come, it might deteriorate the economic system of some of the African countries. So, I'm also in this one thing that was done in Nigeria by a particular governor of the state, which is the issue of empowering young ladies to speak up for themselves. The campaign was called Name Them and Shame Them, a situation whereby um, perpetrators of um, sexual abuse were mentioned and um, at them and condemned in the social media, several televisions and programs. So it was a thing that I had spot. I want to relate this issue, of course, I deal with HIV aid and I'm the present coordinator for young people living with HIV in Nigeria, deputy coordinator, I mean. So when we look at the issue of MCCT cases in Nigeria, I mean, the mother to child transmission of HIV aid, the, the plague 
time was very, very worse in 2002, 2003. So most, most of the young people we have now, within the age of 22, 23, 24, yeah, I'm talking about the M50 cases now. We, is that we identify them to be homeless because we are doing the epidemic, the worst stage of the epidemic. They don't have a father, they have a mother. They have a mother, they don't have a father, but they don't have food. So this issue, I'm talking about 23 to 24 years for them. Yeah, most of them are homeless and we have been, they've, been, they've been suffering from the issue of um, sexual abuse. We've seen a lot of them get raped. We've seen so many vices done to them. I mean, the ladies among them. So I don't know. Margaret have spoken so much about it and others, others in, in the system. What do you think can we do to avert this issue of abuse looking to empty cities in Africa and Nigeria, especially? Thank you, and God bless everybody. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to Thando. Hi, thank you so much. Um, just before I make my point, I just want to um, touch on what um, Sister Seema just said, in that um, I think it's really important for us to actually, as a requirement to, to go to CSW and, uh, and to enter these, these um, global forums, to have um, focus groups that collect data and information that's very specific to the topics that would be unpacked at the conferences. And the reason why I say that is because I would assume that the reason why you select a particular NPC, NPO, or NGO is because you have the assumption that, oh, they would know um, particular information and, and would, or you assume that they have particular data, but that, not, that might not be the truth, you know? Someone might have a, a kind of rough idea about a particular thing, but insofar as the topics that need to be unpacked for the purpose of policies, we need to make sure that there is appropriate preparation for that. And what that entails is that as a requirement to go to these conferences, there should be a focus group or study groups that are undertaken by the organizations that are invited there. The other thing, uh, you know, the, the main point that I wanted to make really comes from Ma'am Margaret Owens, in that, um, you know, Ma'am Margaret, I, I've been working in using the schooling environment as a site of learning to integrate you know, equity in our education so that we can start grooming equitable human beings, as well as to, to implement the already existing, quite frankly, anti-violence interventions within the schooling environment because people come from different homes, et cetera, et cetera. But the blockade there is that even where government has promised, in, and, and I say promise in quotation marks, has promised to allocate a certain amount of money that money never actually gets to where it's supposed to go to. And so, um, you know, what you find is that where there were interventions that could have been implemented, because there are anti-violence uh, interventions that, that work, case studies have been done, research has been shown, you know, but the political will is not there. But let's forget, let's put aside the political will for one second, because they don't want to do anything in any case. There are people, myself included, Sima included, you know, and I'm sure a, a bunch of other people on this platform included, who are experts, who are capable, who do the work, but the funding just isn't there. So my question then becomes, is there something that comes either from the, the uh, uh, equality platform or the, I'm sorry, the generation equality platform or from the CSW platform that tries to assist people that are doing work that um, meets some of the agendas and, and, and the topical issues that are unpacked um, by CSW or by United Nations, etc. I think that um, there needs to be a more robust effort in ensuring that the interventions which have been shown by, by, by um, case studies and evidence, or whatever the case might be, the innovations that have been generated by, by people actually make it into the classroom, actually make it into communities because that's how you make the change. You are not going to get government to shift even where government might want to do something. There's all sorts of a bureaucracy and red tape. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for these insights. I'm going to pause us here and I'm actually going to hand over to Saida, who's going to facilitate this next half of our time together. Um, I see there are a number of hands, but perhaps we can pause and come back to you. You can keep your hands raised, um, but I'll hand over to Saida to introduce a few of our new members of the executive committee. Thank you, Safira. And of course, we'll circle back to all the questions, but it is my great honor, first of all, to welcome both Susan O'Malley and Ivy Koek, who are members of our executive committee. Um, Ivy Koek is the current vice chair of NGO CSW's executive committee, and she is a program coordinator for the Soka Kakai International Office for UN Affairs in New York. She's engaged in SGI's work in the fields of gender equality and women's empowerment, sustainable development, peace, disarmament, and human rights. And Susan has chaired NGOCSW New York since 2015 and was vice chair for the previous four years. She's the main representative to the UN for International Federation of Business and Professional Women. Um, and we are just so excited and honored to have both of you here and would love if you could start us off by sharing some quick background about how you got into the work that we're doing right now, building a better world for women and girls around the world, and your top tips about engaging at the UN, especially for some uh, engaging at the CSW forum, especially for some new delegates who might be joining us on the call today. So Ivy and Susan, over to you. Ivy, you want to start? Ivy. Sure, sure, Maybe I'll start. No start with. Okay, Susan. Okay. So why am I involved in this? So um, I started uh, working in this area eight years ago and um, I didn't specifically have a background in women's uh, studies or anything. My background was in sustainable development. Um, but as I am, you know, one of the UN representatives for my NGO, I was assigned to join the NGO CSW New York Committee, which um, has been my joy and um, the bright spot, <laughs> my hopeful spot <laughs> of my UN work. And, um, and so, so then it, the rest is history. I mean, I'm still doing this and I realize um, with each passing day, the more that I learn about the topic that, you know, I've always been a feminist at heart and, and I'm so excited um, to be involved in, in such a movement, um, such a global movement. And um, I, I would just say, just per, you know, personally getting into, into this, um, I didn't know this world existed, of course, before that civil society, you know, NGO engagement at the UN, what that looked like. You know, my extent of experience was always model UN kind of, you know, so really, you know, this is an intergovernmental, UN is an intergovernmental space. And um, to be able to witness the activism and the passion um, and the beautiful work that's going on uh is just it's just very incredible and uh humbling and so being part of this committee has as always uh it's quite an honor in that sense because we are the convening space you know of all these amazing people and and organizations you know doing good work um and i think the top tips for csw uh i don't know what's been said already so i feel a little loss. Uh, I don't want to repeat my anything else. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I think everyone on here should be already, you know, signed up on the virtual platform. I think that's like first major step. And then I would say to stay on top of UN Women's uh, website for all the side events and then look at the official program for CSW. But I think it's just really um, preparing because once CSW starts, it's, it's so busy and overwhelming. So I think it's kind of the planning is gonna be important. And because we have this virtual space, I think the key is to try to uh, you know, network and connect with people on that virtual platform, have the conversation started now. I, I think, I mean, we have this great opportunity that we normally wouldn't have all this lead time to to connect with each other so i'd like to i personally would like to take more advantage of that this year what is it? That's it. Okay. Should, 
Do you want me to talk or oh wait a minute, am I muted? No. What's happening? Go ahead, Susan. Oh, okay. Um, how to start. First, I want to say Ivy was my vice chair and she was invaluable. And one way she was invaluable was uh, sometimes I get kind of um, excited. What can I say? I'm very passionate, you see? And Ivy was my vice chair. She would put her hand on my shoulder and that meant calm down, will you? And listen. And I, I, th I think about that, Ivy. I miss you. I miss, I miss that hand. Anyway, um, I have to say that I, uh, Margaret, I like seeing all these old friends and I have to, because Margaret's here, I have to say, I am also the UN representative for Margaret's organization, Widows for Peace Through Democracy. And I'm greatly honored to be um, also the UN rep for that organization. But I love seeing all these old friends. I love seeing Saida and, oh my goodness. Um, uh, let's see, um, Rima. Rima Sala that I haven't seen in years and Katrina. Anyway, I think in many ways I could learn uh, probably a whole lot more from you than you can learn from me. But <laughs> um, I enjoyed listening the little bit I enjoyed, um, the little bit that I was here listening to you. Um, okay, how did I get invited, uh, interested in the UN? In the fourth grade, my I guess I was nine, my father took me on a train from Boston where I grew up to the UN. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe that, you know, here, all of these countries together and trying to agree on things and make peace. So I decided when I got, grew up that somehow I would get to the UN. But first, um, what I did at age 20, I decided I was either going to be a professional cellist, I'm a musician, or get a PhD in um, English and be an English professor. So I did that for many, many years, uh, the English professor. And so when I retired, um, a friend said, there's an opening in an NGO. And I got quite excited. And so I signed up. I said, but I haven't retired. Well, this was right before I retired. She said, you'll retire and you won't be grading papers forever. And then you can come join us at, um, you know, at, at the UN. I started first by working with a working group for girls. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. We work with um, young uh, high school girls and we get them acclimated to the UN. We get so they can speak at the UN. And also we greatly influence policy about girls at the UN. And so I'm very proud of that work. Um, then suddenly, um, I, after about a year or two, I was asked if I wanted to be on the uh, executive committee of, um, of CSW. And I said, yes, and I, I applied to be a member at large and they put me as the vice chair, which was slightly crazy. What did I know about anything? Um, except Shakespeare and women's studies. I was good at that and write teaching composition. And so it has been a wonderful, wonderful um, 10 years or so. 